Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 780. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is January 10th, 2023. All right, welcome back to another program of Anglican Unscripted, the first one of the year, the first of many for 2023. I hope you've stopped signing 22 on your checks. Actually, I don't write checks anymore, George. I've not written a check in a long time. It's all done automatically. Oh, my. Well, friends, continue to write checks and mail them to Anglican (laughs) Unscripted. Yes. Uh, We will take checks. Post-dated, pre-dated checks, any sort of check you want to send. Third-party, out-of-state, uh, out-of-state uh, business checks, we'll take them too. Or cash. Yes, is, I'm glad you mentioned this because we are raising money to send George to GAFCON 4 in uh, Kigali, Rwanda. Uh, I still need uh, several hundred dollars to complete that. We got, I'm sending you enough to buy a plane ticket, but then we got to pay for the conference fee and the hotels. So please go to anglican.inc forward slash donate uh you can fill out the paypal thing there if you want to just send a check the address for anglican tv is there if you want to contact us by email to send us money i'm putting my email here and putting george's email there and uh, you can take care of it that way as well but we really do need some resources to get george over to do some reporting for the next gafcon fourth gafcon wow that's a lot george Christmas is over. Uh, I'm starting to relax a little bit. We're back here in Florida. I've got that Florida phlegm because the, p- the pollen here is a little different. How you doing? Just wonderful. Mm-hmm. Uh, been up at night trying to price airline tickets to Kigali, Rwanda, mm-hmm. and just doing all the stuff that you do after Christmas where you basically decompress after a frenetic week or two, mm-hmm. and then you catch up on all the stuff that just got piled up beside you. So, there is a lot. A I mean, time. yeah, we we're back in Florida. We drove here from uh, well, we drove here from Wisconsin. We spent a couple of days in Alabama, and we now have uh, Sasquatch our RV back in our our winter base, and we'll be leaving here in April for our, our travels again. But I want to thank you all again for your prayers uh, over the passing of my father. Uh, everything worked so tremendously, um, and the timing was just. I, I hate to say uber or ultra perfect, but it could not have gone better except dad died. I mean, the timing was amazing, and a lot of that was your prayers, and we really, really appreciate that. All right, let's move on to the program, pulling up my little template. And there's a lot of great names in Anglicanism, George. Lots of great names. Uh, and here's another one. Bingo Allison, he's a uh, priest in the Church of England, discovers he is a woman. And uh, I think we need to talk about that because I'm not here to make light of or make fun of bingo. I'm here to talk about the situation in which a person with gender dysphoria is promoted and and, and ordained a priest uh, in the Church of England, George. Mm Mm-hmm. Bingo Allison, uh, was born a man, uh, he's a man, uh, is in his mid-30s, he's married to a woman, has three children. While he was in seminary, he began to believe he was a woman in a man's body, mm-hmm. and he transitioned uh, in his way of thinking to a non-binary person, neither male nor female. He was ordained by Paul Bayes, the Bishop of Liverpool, uh, just before Bayes retired. And the man's not been able to get a job, really. He's a curate. Um, but he goes around and talks to children at schools about being accepting and opening to non-binary people. This sort of blew up because the Liverpool Echo a newspaper did an uh, interview with uh, uh, Allison and Allison talked about his thinking and his transition and how the Church of England affor- affirms him in being non-binary. And that Liverpool Echo piece spawned a bit of a media frenzy, both from liberal papers and conservative papers and commentators. Um, 
I contacted the Church of England's press office for an answer. They were on Christmas break until recently. And they said, you know, we can't really comment about individuals, but nothing has changed in the Church of England's guidelines. And what is, how, how can we decode this? And how can we help people understand? And I think, Kevin, you're right, that we're not here to pick on Bingo Allison, who has a name out of a P.G. Woodhouse novel. I'm thinking That's a Bingo great Little. name. <laughs> uh, but, but Allison is a victim, I believe, as are his wife and his three children, of the woke mentality of the hierarchy of the Church of England. Rather than reach out and help a man going through a psychological mental crisis, they basically have affirmed him in his illness and basically, but then basically said, fine, you're on your own. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and I think it's, I think the cruelty of a bishop who would ordain and of, but then not deploy and allow him to basically fall into some sort of Gnostic Christianity where God has given him and him alone a special revelation that he and maybe some of the other elect can understand, but the rest of the world can't. I think that's so cruel. I think, and so... Well, I think, it's, Allison, I think it's cruel because of he's now being uh, put before children. And at a certain mm -hmm. point in that role, you become a groomer. And it, there's a point where what you're doing is not just informing the children to be accepting of you, which, okay, we acknowledge as Christians we are to accept, but you want to be affirmed and validated. And that is way too far uh, into this, the realm of the kingdom. We understand what we need to uh, affirm and validate those who are living a life apart from God. Uh, who are also teaching other people that living a life apart from God is holy, righteous, and needs to be validated. And that's kind of this groomer role that's going around, George. I come to this discussion with having had two daughters who, at, in their youth, uh, suffered from anorexia, mm -hmm. where they devoutly believed that they were fat and both starved themselves and both needed psychological counseling, mental health counseling, and it takes years to get through this. And thank God they're both in their late 20s now. They've come through these terrible trials. But it's the same worldview. It's the same mindset. It's the same thing that something in your brain is telling you that there's something wrong with who you are and that what you see is not what is. And Bingo Allison is, it, it would be akin to my affirming my daughter starving herself. Or, or trying to destroy her body because she didn't see it as she thought it should be or she wanted it to be. And it's the same <clears> approach <throat> uh, that we have here with uh, gender dysphoria, which is a real medical illness that is treatable, that can, like anorexia, be amenable to years of therapy. You don't just fix it in one session. Yeah. But instead, the Church of England has chosen to make a political, ideological point and promote somebody, not that will actually promote a cause at a the cause, expense yeah. of a person. And it is a, an expense of a person. It's, it's an expense of a generation. Uh, on Reddit, there's a group called D-Trans. And mm -hmm. um, I'm going to bring that up here. This is, uh, I'll, I'll provide a link in the show notes. This is the stories of thousands and thousands of people who were uh, lied to and told that transitioning would allow them to feel good about their bodies again. And now, after taking hormones and t getting surgery and getting voice box surgery and having their breasts removed or you know their girl parts removed or guy parts added, uh, have shown up on this, this Reddit forum and saying, what what do i do now how do i get my life back how do i get my parts back and a, a lot of people will lie to you and say well there's just a, a small portion of people who transition and then detransition um it they just you know it's like one percent only one percent have to detransition well i hate to say this but forty thousand is not one percent of those who are uh, seeking detransition and 
uh, their lives are ruined. Their physical life is ruined. Uh, and we find ourselves at this point as a society where the society hides the detransition people. They don't want you to know anything about that. They don't, they, the society does not want to know that people who transition are questioning it and want their, their bodies back. Mm -hmm. And 15 years ago, this was solved with three or four years of therapy. We don't do and that 15 anymore. years ago, the church was leading the spearhead against genital female mutilation in Africa, yeah. where these uh, uh, Somalia and Kenya and Uganda and other uh, northern African cultures where they have a practice of uh, basically mutilating the genitals of women as a you know, the, the church was active, you shouldn't do this, you can't do this. And now, lo and behold, Justin Welby is in favor of female genital mutilation and male genital mutilation. Therefore, the Church of England is in favor of it. And therefore, the rest of the Anglican Communion needs to separate itself from this. This is not who you want leading the Anglican Communion. Yeah, the Welby... Uh, there's been a push. The Church of England's education get, uh, guidelines have caused a great deal of controversy because they accept uh, the, the transitioning and the whole gender ideology movement. And part of their guidelines say that you know, a five-year-old, if it affirms that it's uh, of a different sex, it should be. Uh, you should affirm a five-year-old mm -hmm. uh, if it feels that it's really a boy or a girl and doesn't match its biological sex. And Welby, this has been challenged in court. It's been challenged by parents. And Welby has finally spoken out saying, yes, we, the Church of England is right to do this. Welby has come down on the side of genital mutilation. Welby has come down on the side of voodoo and witchcraft science. Mm -hmm. And Welby's come down on the side of woke ideology once again. Um, uh, and therefore, he's taking the side of Mandula. You know, if you want to take this to the extreme, the last time society decided to uh, mangle and uh, cut up bodies was in Nazi Germany. You know, and it didn't work out well then. It's not going to work out well now because uh, the scalpel is not a solution to a psychological, uh, psychiatric problem. I was talking to my daughter, Laura, who had spent, just came back from two and a half, three months in India, where she has many friends, college friends. And Laura is fair skinned, tall, blonde haired, blue eyed. And she was, she said to me, you know, it was just so sad because I would talk to some of my girlfriends, Laura would say, and her friends spend a fortune. They're, we they're wealthy Indians, um, upper class. Indians, and they spend a fortune on creams to lighten their skin, mm -hmm. to have surgery to basically make them look less Indian and more their ideal of being Western. And Laura's point is, you know, Laura, who's had no surgery, you know, does, but who had suffered from anorexia uh, as a teen, said, you know, it's the same, it's not the same illness, but it's the same way of thinking that to be perfect, I have to somehow change myself and whether it's cultural or mental or ideological i just do not think this is the right way forward and for the church of england's archbishop of canterbury to be on the on the mutilation side is just abhorrent yeah. it's hard to watch you know this is generation me uh this is you know the generation that uh we are allowing to have a distorted reality of who they are and what they look like. And this is where the internet is to blame. This is where social media is to blame. This is where parents are to blame. And this is exactly where the church is to blame. The church should be standing up and say, no, your identity is through Jesus Christ alone. Your identity is not through Facebook, Instagram photos, uh, social postings, your LinkedIn account, especially your LinkedIn account. That's where people really lie <clears throat> on the resume. But that's not your identity. Your identity is through Christ alone. And as Paul told us, we are to live our lives to be transformed. Not into the world, 
No, 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 no. We transformed into Christ. And uh, we're not seeing that. And uh, well, we, the, the church has to and should get gender and sex right. If it doesn't, it, you've lost it. This is the one thing that should be easy to get right. Just saying. And, and I speak from experience because George and I don't do a whole lot before we turn the camera on. This is Kevin's morning face. That's George's morning face. Well, you took a shower and combed your hair, but uh, I took a shower and there's no, no, no hair to comb and we don't care. That's just, that's just life. Let's move on to our next story. David Poligli's church is in the news. He is the rector of Christ Church, Jerusalem, and his cemetery was vandalized. And he, he's laying out some important things that are going to happen now and in the future about uh, persecution of Christians in the Middle East, George. Yeah, uh, in the news, uh, Mount Zion Cemetery, which is the Protestant cemetery, it's about 175 years old, 150 years old in Jerusalem. It's uh, maintained and owned by Christ Church Jerusalem, uh, was vandalized over the Christmas, where closed circuit TV security cameras saw two men who outwardly look, appeared Jewish. They had kippahs or yarmulkes. They had the tizzits, the, fray, the, the white frayed knots coming from underneath their shirts. They were dressed as Orthodox Jews. They were toppling and destroying gravestone and grave markers, including the grave of Samuel Gobat, the second Anglican Bishop of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And, <clears throat> you know, outrage. Uh, there was a lot of public statements. Uh, the Archbishop of, in Jerusalem, uh, uh, Archbishop Welby, um, political leaders all said this is terrible. Israel police announced the arrest uh, of a 14-year-old and 18-year-old man from boys, 14, 18 are boys, from uh, central Israel who were <clears throat> Jewish zealots. And David Pelegi was on the Christian Broadcasting Network uh, giving a report, an interview on this. And one of the things he said is that we're seeing a rise in the persecution of Christians from zealots of in Israel and in the Palestinian territories, Muslim extremists, jihadists, Hebrew, Israeli zealots, looking to remove the Christian presence from Israel, Palestine. So the Christian community in Israel is doing better than in Palestine, but oh, in the entire region, there are people who wish from two opposite extremes to drive the Christians out of the region and have them move all to California or someplace. I, you know, where are they going to go? I, um, and we've discussed before, Christianity has lost the benefit of the doubt. Uh, mm -hmm. in, in people's mind, uh, being a Christian was okay. Uh, being part of the Christian community was wonderful. And we would have this ecumenical understanding, even, no matter how zealot you were, uh, as long as you were not a, an Islamic extremist. The, and so we've now come to the point where there is a growing intolerance towards Christianity and a growing intolerance towards your Christian neighbor. And we're seeing that mm -hmm. ironically in Jerusalem. Uh, I think we're going to see more and more breakouts around the world. But you and I get this these emails all the time about persecution in China, persecution in Vietnam, persecution in, in communist uh, countries. It's no longer just the communist countries. Yeah, we, we did a story about the Australian, uh, fo their football, the Australian Definitely. football executive yeah. Yeah. who was forced out of his job because he, was a, he attended an Anglican church that taught traditional human value, moral yeah. values. And the the liter the woke crowd in Australia said you can't have somebody who believes ab abortion is wrong running a a, a sports club. And the guy had to step down because he, the the uh, board of directors of the sports group cl caved into the conventional wisdom. Uh, you couldn't be you cannot be a public Christian and have any sort of high profile position in Australia was seemed to be the lesson. And that's essentially the same worldview that led two Jewish teenagers to destroy 
ancient gravestones. Now, stupid kids do stupid things all around uh, the world. Yeah, I don't want to over-assign their roles here, but they didn't know they're knocking over some bishop's gravestone. They're just stupid, you know, for the most part, stupid Orthodox kids said, let's go knock, let's go, uh, knock over gravestones at a Christian cemetery, you know? Yeah, I mean, you can read about D dumb kids doing dumb things in graveyards oh, all around oh, the United yeah. States. Uh, so this, on one level, isn't that big, but it is, as David Plenke it, points out, it's emblematic yes. of the difficult position that the Christian minority in Israel and in the Palestinian territories is facing right now from the majority. Next story. Uh, we've certainly reported on the story of Peter Ball, uh, over the last five or six years on our channel, and on, on Scripted and on Anglican.inc, his attorney has been disbarred. And it's an interesting story, George. Peter Ball was the Bishop of Gloucester. And Peter Ball was a very charismatic personality. Not mm -hmm. a, He was an Anglo-Catholic monk. Uh, and he basically... <clears throat> typified, you know, aggressive, strong, popular Anglo-Catholicism. He was really a wonderful face for the church. And he had the ear of celebrities, famous people, the royalty, the royals. Um, he was that type he of was personality. A of King Charles. And I want to be <laughs> Peter Ball's... Oops, sorry, sorry, sorry. I want to be Peter Ball's friend. And he, he had that dynamic personality, George. Yes, excuse me, I'm, I'm puppy sitting three dogs and they see somebody <laughs> whom they don't care for out the window. I know, it was me. Um, Peter, uh, but Peter Ball had a secret life and that he was a molester. He, young men who would come to him uh, to basically be introduced to Christian uh, asceticism and anesthetism would get molested. Yeah. And this was covered up and hindered. Well, the story is that when things came out, uh, Ball's, Ball hired as his, soli his solicitor, his attorney, was also the chancellor of the Diocese of Gloucester. So the man who protected Peter Ball in court was the man who was also responsible for prosecuting him uh, it, it within the church. Well, the Law Society, which is their bar so association, if you will, in England, looked into this and just uh, this last week uh basically the fellow was asked to resign his membership he's retired now but he was essentially disbarred in american terms giving up his law license uh what bill clinton had to do in arkansas <laughs> sort of thing uh after the monica walensky mm -hmm. uh, story broke and here's the thing it took an outside group the law society to basically to police the Church of England's legal structures. Where was the Church of England uh, when the man who was defending Peter Ball, trying to cut a deal, trying to get him you know, not prosecuted, trying to get him not disbarred, where were they when this man was both on the side saying, I represent the diocese and we must take action against the bishop, and he's also representing the bishop who's defending against the actions taken by the diocese. Where was the Church of England? It was nowhere. Yeah. And 10 years, I don't know how many years it's oh, been one, since. Oh, 10, yeah. Long All time. since been in prison, and I think he's yeah. out of jail by now. Mm -hmm. yeah, he is out of jail. He's been and out of prison. I mean, this is how many years after the fact that they finally get it right, and then they didn't even think to get it right. Um, is this system working here's an example no it's not no not at all if you're in a if you and how what does this say to the abused victims who are still waiting for the apology justin welby's promised still waiting for the meeting with him uh to discuss what they went through at the hands of jonathan smythe what does it say to them that the lawyers are playing both sides against each other that the lawyers who are supposed to investigate are also there defending to make sure that the news doesn't get out. And it's not just Peter Ball's law, uh, lawyer. I am I know one fellow who's recently retired, who was chancellor of a province, chancellor of a diocese, and also at the same time running uh, yeah, So I know who you're talking about. Yeah, that's right, yeah. 
running interference with the investigations. When is he going to be disbarred? Probably never, and or until somebody actually makes a stink about it. No. I mean, we have, in the last 15, 10, 15 years of the show, discussed the hypocrisy of the Church of England uh, many times. We will do so in the future. Uh, this is a, uh, a province in need of great reformation, in need of uh, repentance, and in need of a course change. They have not only not define themselves versus society they have adopted society and culture into their church and are now validating and affirming it as good and holy and that ain't going to cut it well if i may i'll give a plug for the episcopal church they make no bones about being <laughs> no, they heretics <laughs> no they don't <laughs> they don't they don't despite they don't say well we're still the old church that you used to love and no. granny was buried in no they, you know, as Gene Robinson said, God is doing something new, and they're telling people this, and they, you know, they're straightforward in their heresy. Well, the Church of England has a wonderful way of just being, oh, well, uh, th there was a little minor story. Uh, the Dean of Montreal, who is in a same-sex relationship uh, uh, in Canada, comes to England and oh, I thought he I thought he was I thought he was married to his partner in Canada in Quebec yeah you can be married or have a domestic partnership and they are the same thing okay there's no difference in Quebec law or you can have a common law marriage got it he didn't have a common law marriage he had a uh, the French word, whatever it is, uh, <laughs> he had a marriage, and he would give these sermons about the joy of sexual relations with his male partner. He goes to England, uh, and he's now the interim dean of Chelmsford, and we point out the fact that he's a partnered gay man in a sexual relationship, or at least he's been, you know, he's been touting it. And uh, one of our readers approached the one of our viewers approached the Bishop of Chelmsford and said, "What about this?" They said, "Oh, no, we allow same-sex partnerships in England, uh, and therefore he's not doing anything wrong." Well, the point is, he's not chaste, no. or he wasn't chaste and was promoting a non-chaste sexuality with a marriage slash partnership in Canada, and now he comes to England, and the Church of England can live under this cloak of hypocrisy. Well. We don't have concrete evidence that he's engaging in sexual activity with his partner. Therefore, it's all fine. So, hold on. You're basically saying the Church of England and his diocese doesn't believe him because he touts it. He says, mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with it. I get to do it all the time, but when he was in Canada. So, the diocese hires a person they don't even believe. What a shame. Nope. All right. Yeah. What are you going to do? And what are you going to do? I know. <laughs> I mean, the last thing I want to do is come on here every week and report about how bad the Church of England is and how, you know, it's getting disgusting, in my opinion. But I want to do this because so many uh, archbishops and bishops and clergy people around the world watch this show. And if it wasn't reported here, you wouldn't hear about it. If we, do, you know, you, they're not watch, reading the, the church news or uh, getting uh, regular updates from the Church of England about what's really happening there, George. Well, we do have some good news to report, or at least the start of some good news. Philip North. Mm -hmm. Yeah, got a diocese. Oh, boy. Philip North is a member of the society. He's an Anglo-Catholic bishop on the traditional wing of the church. Mm-hmm. And a few years ago, he's been Bishop of Burnley, which is a suffragan position. And he was uh, he was uh, put forward to become a diocesan bishop. And the women's groups all went ballistic because he is does not believe in women's ordination. And he, he was put under such pressure that he basically declined the Back invitation out, yeah. to be bishop. Yeah. Well, it was announced uh, this morning that he has will he has been appointed uh, Bishop of Blackburn in succession to Julian Henderson. Henderson yeah. retired and is the current chairman of the Church of England Evangelical Council. So, 
maybe Blackburn is more menable and that he won't get the grief, but you know, a good man, you know, no no person is perfect. We can all pick holes in everybody's oh, life, sure. starting yeah. with me. Uh but they are promoting North. Uh and we'll see if the women's groups come out again this time to derail that also. Well, Philip North was proof that mutual flourishing was a lie. Uh, before uh, Philip North, uh, there was kind of this nod, nod, wink, wink. We're not going to uh, have a person who doesn't support uh, female or women's ordination orders in the church. When Philip North was uh, put forward, the feminists came out of the woodwork. I was surprised I didn't see Justin Welby protesting Philip North's uh nomination so we proved through philip north that mutual flourishing does not work in the church of england what will happen now that he has another diocese taking him up will they come out of the woodwork will justin welby himself protest philip north's nomination well, george welby i can i can tell you what welby will say right now without even asking oh that's the province of york that's stephen cottrell's problem that's not right. my yes problem. <laughs> Amen. But personally, you know, but I and and you know, in light of Re Welby's recent statements that he can't have personal uh, views on things, he can only be a focus of unity. This mm -hmm. might be another position that he punts the ball as well. I'm not going to answer the question. All right. Next news story: the cardiac arrest seen around the world. Uh, for those people who are watching Monday night, Sunday night football, uh, a week and a half ago. They watched a uh, safety. Okay, when I say football, I know half the audience thinks we're talking about a round ball. No. Okay, this is the football with the oblong ball that uh, we use here in America. We're talking about American football. And we had a Sunday night game between uh, uh, the Bills, Bills and Cleveland. Cleveland, yep. And Damar Hill, who's a safety uh, for the Bills. Uh, made it a hard tackle. He stood up, fell down, and went into cardiac arrest. 24 and, years old. 24 years old. And I'm watching the TV. We can't, we're, we're really watching the, the game. But I remember a uh, player down, let's go to commercial. Came back from commercial. There's a group of players of both teams surrounding this guy, and they're backing an ambulance onto the field. And just if you look really close, you can see somebody doing CPR. I'm like, chill, what's going on on the TV? And we're like, oh no, oh no. And we said a little prayer because this is horrifying to see a person getting CPR. And hundreds of millions of people were watching. And hundreds of millions of people broke out in prayer. The people in the stadium broke out in prayer. This guy was in such dire straits that an ESPN commentator the Atheist Network, their sports network, but they're also an Atheist Network, broke out in prayer. Now, George, we read about his healing and his release from the hospital. Wow. The Damar Hill Hamlin story really is the religious story of the past few weeks in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, not only the incident itself, where he was, and we do not know why he had a heart attack. Okay. Uh, um, uh, cardiac arrest. Card cardiac arrest. Okay. We do not know why this occurred. Um, plenty of speculation from mm -hmm. reaction to COVID vaccine to that rare one in a million occasion where you get hit at the moment the beat is supposed to take place and it interrupts it and all that stuff. Yeah. So we don't know why it happened. We, we did, but what we saw in the aftermath was both teams the players spontaneously went down on one knee and were led in prayer by other players mm -hmm. um but as you mentioned espn is hard left in their politics and is as woke as it comes on air their commentator offered a spontaneous prayer to god and jesus christ to heal damar hamlin mm -hmm. um hamlin is a roman catholic uh and you uh, he is a Christian, and he has a little charity that raises uh, uh, money to support the children of his hometown, Homestead, Pennsylvania, which is a steel town outside of Pittsburgh, near Ambridge. Uh, 
And the reaction across the United States was not a mockery of prayer, was not righteous indignation that prayer would be put forward, not the sort of stuff you, not the sort of stuff that the woke and the literati tell us is the proper response of healthy skepticism, but the United States if you will, collectively got on their knee and prayed that the Lord intervene in the life and in the case of Damar Hamlin. Um, Damar Hamlin, I, nobody knew who he was. He's just, you know, how many people on a football team? 40, 50. A, you know, he was one of one player on two dozen teams. Yeah. And now, but he was used by God. His illness was used by God to reawaken in the mind of many Americans the power of prayer, the importance of prayer, the centrality of prayer. And they see him almost miraculously climbing out of his deathbed. They did CPR for eight minutes uh, where he wasn't breathing. Um, and, you know, I can remember the doctors on the news shows later that night saying, well, He's, he survived the heart attack, but without but, oxygen to his brain for that long, it yeah. may not be good for his mental abilities. And, and to be fair, science has shown the longer you are down, you know, the less likely you are to have a full recovery. Um, mm -hmm. And because you're, you don't have the oxygen to the brain. He survived uh, nine minutes without a pulse, nine minutes of oxygen to the brain. And in all parlance, this should be touted as a miracle. And the cool mm -hmm. thing was it was witnessed by all and nobody is questioning well if you're an atheist you're you're welcome to question whether this is a miracle that's fine but for people who believe and understand prayer is real and for people who um are in religious sports communities this is a great encouraging moment in their lives and hopefully in the life of the church you know, I, this is a, an opportunity to say, you know, prayer, when, when you take a knee appropriately, it works. Uh, and uh, um, it was it's fun to watch. And it's fun to watch that um, there's still, a, a week later, not much mockery of prayer. You know, that this, this is what we want most, something that glorifies God. It doesn't glorify Damar. It doesn't glorify the team, the coach. Um, anybody else? This is a glory to God. Nothing can glorify the Buffalo Bills, Kevin. <laughs> Not anymore. No. Well, hold on. Wait, 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 wait. My Vikings play the Bills uh, in in two weeks, so I I, I hope you're right. You know, but uh, we'll have to see. This is this is an amazing story. Uh, take heart in it as a Christian, knowing that uh, a person who was for all intents and purposes dead as a doornail uh, uh, was healed. What I would say through prayer. Yeah. And for those of us who tell us that religion is passe in the United States, that we're going to go the way the Europe has gone, I just point to this popular reaction to Damar Hamlin. Yeah. And it wasn't uh, superstition. It was faith that was uh, expressed, I think, by by the players on the field, by the people in the stands, by the broadcasters by the average men and women watching this by the example of the christians the christian uh people on that football team took a knee because they knew that that's the only chance the people in the stadium put their phones down and and, and broke out in prayer because this guy is dead and getting cpr People watching on TV, you couldn't see the CPR on TV. We're listening to the commentators who are just aghast. I have to fill time now. I don't know how what to say, you know, and they're just making up things on air do you, to, to fill the time, fill the time. Well, they're going to have to restart the game here in a couple minutes. You know, no, they're not. <laughs> and so it's, it's interesting to see uh, when Christian leaders, you know, and I say leaders as in sports figures here, Christian sports figures took a knee, the world took a knee. The world said, yeah, we, we will uh, certainly pray for this, this individual. And also, Christianity is ridiculed at times for being feminine. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the only people you see in church are old ladies. Here you had uh, 60, 70 men in the fullness and prime of life, mm -hmm. you know, all gathered, black, white, um, 
praying to the same God, praying to the same end, praying in the name of Jesus Christ. Yeah. It Pray. really gave a sense, you know, when, uh, you know, I don't wish to exclude anybody, but it is a powerful thing to see men at prayer. Absolutely. All right, next story, Pope Bet. Could, could I yeah, ask no, if we sure. could hold off on Benedict? Because sure. that could be a show by itself. Let's do it. Because it I could be. I see. Benedict, yeah, yeah. Benedict is is the most was the most consequential pope for the Anglican renewal movement ever. Mm -hmm. uh, not just all he did for the Catholic Church, but going back to Plano in two thousand three. And I don't want to squish this into ten minutes. No, I it really. Yeah. He was into a Reformation outside of the Roman Catholic Church. And, he was reformed uh, uh, before reform being was yeah, I know. <laughs> and I, I do agree that that could be a whole uh, 50 minute episode so alright we'll hold off on Pope Benedict in, in case you didn't know a lot of say people say this is the only show you watch for news Pope Benedict died okay and the funeral was held on Friday so just bring you up to speed uh, next story uh, oh a Nigerian story Church of Nigerian a priest with special revelation decides probably after the second marriage that polygamy is not so good after all and recants george that doesn't happen too often yes a, a, a priest at the church of nigeria a real honest to goodness parish priest some not 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 some nut job floating along had a revelation from god that polygamy was okay and the bible supported it you know uh david and solomon and all this and that well he uh, was deposed, you know, he was slapped down, saying you cannot be <laughs> a polygamy supporting priest in the church in Nigeria. Uh, yes, in the Episcopal church, you can get married five times, but they have to be sequentially. You can't <laughs> sequentially. do it all at the same time. No overlapping. Uh, but, but he basically had this special revelation. He was a bishop of the, uh, a priest of the diocese of Nenwe, I think it was. He, uh, this was a 90 day, you know, this was a 30 day wonder story. And the Church of Nigeria recently announced that he had recanted. He had confessed his error. He had abjured his false teachings and he had been restored and returned to the bosom of the church. And. Okay, first of all, good. I am very pleased to report these types of stories where a person who's gone off the farm a little bit. I explored a little bit of, of special revelation, said, hell no, and came back, George. It, maybe that second mother-in-law was just a bit too much. For <laughs> I, do, yeah. you know, I know the, the complications of one marriage. Uh, it, did now, not Solomon have a thousand wives? Well, whatever, it was a big... <laughs> but one of the big uh, consistent lies that uh, we've heard from the liberals over the years, and I've heard bishops mention this, is that the Anglican communion in Africa tolerates polygamy. That there are, you know, I can remember after Lambeth 2008, there was yeah. one bishop, bishop of Eastern North Carolina was telling people he met a Sudanese, South Sudanese bishop who had two wives with him at Lambeth. Well, the idiot was wrong because it was his wife and his wife's mother, and he couldn't tell them apart. Um, Let, let's but, not use the word idiot. We'll just use the, the confused person in purple. Yes. Well, the, the point is he was ideologically confused because, mm -hmm. well, if they can have polygamy, then we can allow gay marriage because both are equally wrong. So we're going to two wrongs will make a right in this situation. Um, but no, polygamy is fiercely opposed uh, the, the, in and in the African churches. They take different paths toward it. There are some churches that if a polygamist becomes a Christian, he is not to put away his excess wives. He may not take any new wives, but he must care for his existing household. He can't just throw a woman out in the street and her children because he now can only have one wife. But he, his wife, he may take no more wives and his children may not be polygamists. That's one approach. Other approaches are you must divest yourself of the excess baggage. Um, that's how polygamy is treated in Africa by the Anglican Church. But there's a push against it that's a lot of it is cultural. Well, you know, there are parts of our culture and tradition where polygamy is celebrated, people in Nigeria will say. 
and it's and it's the same arguments if you will that i hear from the supporters of uh i hear from bishop stephen croft in oxford that we have to allow gay marriage because our culture approves of it and supports it and we have friends who are gay and who want to get married yeah, they're this just Nigerian, fine they're, they're nice yeah yeah this nigerian priest was making the exact same arguments i have friends who are pagans who have multiple wives and they're wonderful people i have relatives who are have are polygamous and therefore we should find a way to welcome in the bosom of the church well he basically found out that this was not the right way and however his redemption and reform came about it happened but he had the same process of bingo allison had of a private revelation that god is doing a new thing god is doing a new thing for bingo allison allowing nine creating Ma male and female, he created them, plus none of the above, non-binary. You know, that revelation was as false as this Nigerian priest's was, except the Nigerian priest, I think, got straightened out. Self-revelation through Gene Robinson effectively destroyed uh, what was left of the healthy Episcopal Church. Self-revelation... Well, it drove a stake, drove yeah. another stake. Sorry. Another stake in it. <laughs> Whatever was still twitching had another stake driven through it. Self revelation uh, through transgenderism will, you know, be another stake driven through the Church of England uh, and Canada and here in America as well. Uh, there's no uh, room for self revelation in a church, especially a healthy church. Um, the two cannot coexist. We have reason, we have scripture, we have tradition. Transgenderism fits in none of those, George. None. It's the gospel of Frank Sinatra. I've got to be me. I've got, got to, to be, be free. free. Yeah. Generation me. Uh, that's you know that's not one of the pill. That's not one of the three legs on the Anglican stool. The Sinatra, Sammy Davis Jr. stool. It's not how it works. No, and yeah. Uh, the all, and we are in a society right now where the only way forward to get out of this mess is through the redemption love of Jesus Christ. We've got ourselves in such a pickle that God is the only way out. So we'll have to see what happens. I'm I'm rooting for God in this. Yeah. And also think of what courage it took for this priest to admit he was wrong, to basically recant his error not just double down and form his own breakaway little sect and this and that yeah. but to rather return to truth and righteousness and to the revelation of god and make his confession and come back that takes courage and we don't often see courage these days among leaders great time to switch topics using the word courage all right it i we never ask for money on Anglican Unscripted unless there's really a need. Uh, George and I are both, you know, gainfully employed. Um, I'm to the point now where uh, 49 out of every $100 I make goes to the government. Oh, boy. You know, and so uh, we don't need money for Kevin, ourselves. if you were still in Connecticut, what would that number be? <laughs> oh, it'd be worse. Uh, I had to really do some... Uh, <clears throat> challenging accounting to stay healthy in, in Connecticut. I didn't break any laws, but my, my accountant was very good there. I don't need much accounting down here, you know, but so in as such, we do need money to travel to events like uh, GAFCON 4. And I need you to have some courage. There's thousands of people who watch every episode of Anglican Scripted. If you could go and PayPal us $5 or $10 or 20, I think 20 is a good average. We give you uh, more value than 20 for a whole year of episodes here, I hope. So, uh, you know, I, I'm just, I'm going out there on a limb. Uh, I take no salary for all the time I've given Anglican TV in 15 years. George gets a little stipend for uh, dinner here and there, and he gets plane tickets. So please help with uh, going to anglican.inc forward slash donate and you will find more information there on how to give us a donation. We are also a 5013C. You can write off your donation if you so desire. There, I said it. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 780 of Anglican Unscripted.